Okay, good morning, everybody. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Well, and uh, hope your march towards the high holidays is progressing in a positive way. It's, uh, you know, these are, these are amazing days, days that are very um, useful and have a lot of potential for, for growth and for getting ourselves into the mindset of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, which is just around the corner. So um, nothing like a little Ram Chal to get us in that, back in that mindset. So we're gonna jump right in to where we left off, which is on page 107. And um, just to give everybody a little bit of a geography, lesson over here where we are holding in this book we are in chapter five and actually may even that really be able to finish chapter five today um in which case after that we'll move on to a new mida a new trait the one that we've been dealing with for quite some time is zahirus and zahirus is all about living a focused life, living an examined life, gaining clarity about where we're going, what we're trying to achieve and accomplish while we're here on earth, and focused on the uh, focused on the goal, which is closest to Hashem. And that's what Zihirus is all about. And we talked about how to acquire Zihirus, how to acquire this trait, how one develops this attribute. And now we're discussing the things that get in the way. Because as I always like to say, you know, if, if I were to ask everyone in this call, you know, are you, um, are you interested in, in living a, a thoughtful, examined, intentional life where your goals are clear and you're focused and you're driven towards becoming the person that God gave you the potential to be. I'm pretty sure every one of us would say yes. Um, and then at the same time, you know, um, there's a there's a discrepancy between our value of this Mida, of this quality and the way we're living our lives. And the reason for that is because it's hard, like all good traits, and qualities that are to be acquired, it's very difficult. And then Uncle is focusing on the three things that get in our way. And the three, and what are the three things that prevent us from, um, from achieving this quality? So the first one that we focused on was an over-dependence or an over, over preoccupation with worldly matters. And when I say worldly matters, it means that I'm I'm too focused on the here and now. I'm too focused on whatever might be weighing on making a living or raising a family or getting my kids into the right college or whatever might be the things that are life related things. As I always say, life has a way of getting in the way of us becoming the people that we're intended to be. We get preoccupied with these things. And they take over. And these urgencies, um, as we like to say, uh, take precedence over the, over the things that are most critical in life. And um, we, we end up focusing our whole life on our to-do list, and we don't spend enough time on our to-be list, or as David Brooks says, we spend too much time on our resume virtues at the expense of our eulogy virtues. So that's preoccupation with worldly matters. The second factor that detracts, which is the one that we spoke about last week and the week before, I think is levity and mockery. Our sort of built-in defense mechanism that we use when we sense an opportunity for growth or inspiration might be around the corner, we make jokes. We um, make light of people that have wisdom to share we undermine the source of that wisdom. We do anything we can to sort of discredit, uh, to joke and to make light of the serious opportunities of our lives because 
those serious opportunities we know intuitively are demanding something from us, whether it's growth in some way, or it's a change of our perspective, or changing our behavior or attitudes, whatever it is, we understand that you know this moment carries a lot of potential for us to grow and change. And growth and change is the is the last thing in the world that the Yitzhara wants to do. And therefore, out comes levity and mockery, which is uh, the way that we just sort of undercut that, that those moments and those opportunities. The third one, the third one is um, on page 107, where we're up to right now, which is keeping bad company. Okay, and, and I and I gave a little warning last week, that, you know, that uh, that this is going to be a, a little bit of a touchy subject. Hold on one second, let me get the book right here. Pardon me. Okay. Um, so keeping bad company. Let me ask, let's open this up right away for the beginning. Before we even jump in, it's always worthwhile to see before we see what the Ram Paul has to say, and we're in the end of chapter five, towards the end of chapter five. Before we see what the Ram Paul has to say, let's ask ourselves. Um, quickly, you know, quick answers. No, uh, we don't, we don't, you know, no, no one needs to, you know, dwell too long. But what are the first things that come to mind? Quick answers. Why, in what way does keeping bad company get in the way of us acquiring the trait of Zihirus, vigilance? Uh, David? Yeah. Oh, okay. First of all, can we just skip back one, one thing about mockery? is that in my experience, I've encountered mockery, but that takes a certain energy, right? A lot of people just deny. In other words, they just won't even embrace it as a, as a possibility and just you know look at you with a blank look or say, well, that works for you. I could never do that. I'm not religious. I'm not spiritual. You know what I mean? In other words, they don't even um, have to go to the next step of using that kind of defense. It's just inertia is way too great. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But then for those of us who do have a tendency and do want that growth and are likely to, to, to move in that direction, we can use levity and mockery to, uh, to undercut it as well. Yeah. And uh, to answer your question about bid, you know, a bid, a company, it's like social proof. If enough people are doing something, I think it's a sociological phenomenon that other people will follow suit. If everybody's across the street looking at looking in the window of a of a store or there's a there's a um, there's a street sale, people are going to cross the street. They're going to want to know what is going on. And if a lot of people are buying, they may look seriously and they may buy. So I think that's just a, a sociological phenomenon that people tend to be followers. And if they're friends, relatives, people that the not so much respect, but don't want to be different than they're going to line up, which is where the expression, the crowd is untruth comes from. In other words, what the majority feels usually spiritually or intellectually is usually wrong. That is true, that is true. Okay, good. So what else, what else? Why is this this keeping bad company something that gets in the way of us acquiring um, views? Well, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, friendly or keeping bad company, they can have a influence on you to do things that would be wrong or just simply distract you or create levity with you or you somebody you can mock with too. So they obviously, you know, they, they can lead you in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, one second. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, excellent, excellent. Now let's see um what the Ram Paul says okay so he says see also that in accordance with the severity of the trend oh sorry wrong place down on the uh, further down keeping bad company 
The third factor that undermines the heroes is keeping bad company. That is the company of fools and sinners. Okay, um, before we go on, I just want to differentiate what's the difference between fools and sinners? Right, so, so I mean, it's pretty obvious, but let's talk about sinners first. Sinners are people, yeah, go ahead, Larry. What are you going to say? I was going to say intention. Okay, what do you mean by that? That in the case of a, you know, fools, you know, some people just are narsh. They do silly things, they talk silly ways, and they pull you in a different way. And some sinner, in the case of sinners, a lot, there's intent. You know, they, they plan on doing this. They have, they have full intent and focus on doing it. And they have no issue about dragging you along with them. Okay, good. I like that. I like that. I was thinking along those lines. I was thinking that, you know, sinners are a little bit are more severe in the sense that they're, they've already, um, you know, their actions are, are already... Um, filled with some some level of immorality. Whatever they're doing, they're 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 involved in immoral acts in some area, some some arena. And um, they're knowingly or wantonly or intentionally, like you said, transgressing and acting in, in inappropriate ways. Fools are and, and that goes, and I think that goes without saying that we want to avoid uh, keeping the company of sinners because you know. People, as, as Jeff was said at the very beginning, people are influenced by other people. It's actually the Rambam actually says that if you look down on the very bottom of the page, at the very, very bottom, under the line, it says Rambam writes the nature of man that he's drawn after his friends and acquaintances and his development of character, traits, and actions. He naturally behaves like the people living where he is located. It is therefore incumbent upon a person to befriend the righteous and to sit among the sages constantly so as to learn from them and their actions. He must distance himself from the wicked who walk in darkness so as not to learn from them and their deeds. Okay, so, um, so that's, that is the Rambam saying exactly what Jeff just said. And that's, that's, we are very, very influenced by people around us. We tend to think like them. We tend to dress like them. We tend to act like them. We tend to view the world like them. So if we're surrounding ourselves by sinners, you know, which we'll say are, are people that are knowingly or purposely, you know, committing acts of immorality or, or you know, violating, let's say, the Torah in, 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 you know, in certain areas, then we definitely don't want to, you know, be overly involved with, that, with their company. But it doesn't even have to go that far. It doesn't even have to be sinners that we're trying to avoid, but even fools. And fools are are a little bit, they're just like I like the word you said, Larry, nourish. They're just they're nourish, they're foolish, they're 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 not trying to do bad, they're not setting out to act in more in with immorality or trying to drag people along with them. They're just focusing on the wrong things in life. Their their values and their priorities are not what your values and priorities are, or they're just not diligent enough, or vigilant enough they don't they haven't worked on zahirus and they're just going through life and enjoying the you know but what's for the what the pleasure that's for the taking we also want to avoid that type of environment because it's going to have an impact on us it's going to lower lower our moral standard it's going to minimize our or, or shrink our commitment to spiritual growth so that's all fine and good but i have a question and this is what bothers me about this. This is, what, this is where my personal struggle comes when it, when it comes to what the Ramkhal is saying right now. What about Q? What about outreach? What about Jews reaching out to fellow Jews, fellow brothers and sisters, to try to teach them, try to uplift them, try to guide them and direct them on a path of Torah on a path of godliness, on a path of midot development, on a path of spirituality, on a path of mitzvahs. If we're supposed to avoid the sinners and we're supposed to avoid the fools, 
then are we supposed to lock ourselves? Let's say, you know, we determine that we're moral people, we're religious people, we're spiritual people, and, you know, and we don't want to have any, we don't want to be influenced negatively in any way by the people around us who have a lower moral standard, who are not observant as we are, who are not as holy as we are. So we're going to cloister ourselves into a, you know, into a ghetto in Meisharim or in wherever and have nothing to do with the world outside of us. And we're going to do everything to keep it away and keep it out. And not, is that what Judaism is about? Is that what it means to be a light into the nations? Is that the mission? David? Of the yeah. Um, isn't there something that if someone was raised in a totally secular and you know, environment knows nothing about Yiddishkeit, but they still have the potential because Hashem made us that way. We have a pre predetermined ability to understand Torah. So it isn't the analogy raised by wolves. Therefore, these people are not necessarily inferior. They're they're just unlearned. A hundred percent. You're a hundred percent right. But they're going to influence me negatively. You're these people are not guilty. They they were they're like a kidnapped child. They didn't know any better. They grew up without Judaism. They grew up without a Jewish education. They never had a Zaidi who took them to shul. They never met a rabbi or a rebbitzin. They never heard a class from the Ramchal. They're not they're not to be blamed. They're not. To, there's nothing wrong with them. But they're going to influence me negatively. They're going to have a negative impact on me. They're going to bring me down. Yeah, That's but light down is just darkness. If the you're, says over here, we have to avoid, we have to avoid people that are going to that are fools and sinners because we're going to be exposed to bad influences. But the, but the Torah is replete about how important it is to treat thy neighbor as yourself, and and that Jews have to be united and loved for Mashiach to come. Now maybe that's so, uh, okay. So so that's, that's, my, that's my, So you you're. You're not answering my question. You're you're asking my question for me, which I appreciate. Which is, what is the Ramchal talking about over here? How does he say this? How does he say we're supposed to? Be, you know, it sounds like he's saying we have to be very careful at, at all costs to avoid people that are going to be a bad influence on us, fools and sinners. So I, my new recommendation is, you know, we're going to close the doors at Lachaim Center. Whoever's in is in. We're not going to let any of those fools or sinners walk in the door anymore. We're going to put up a big sign that says fools and sinners stay out and we're not going to work. Our whole community is based on Kiru, on outreach, on opening the doors to whoever walks in. Not only that, you're going to have to kick out half the people who are already there. <laughs> do I start right now? I can do that. Actually, I can actually... <laughs> I was gonna remove. I was gonna remove you, Jeffrey, but I wouldn't do that. I was the first one. I'll, I'll be the first one to, to be the leader. Okay. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> so, so I don't. Know. I, I, yeah. Just because <clears throat> someone doesn't know Torah and doesn't know all the beauty of Judaism doesn't make him a fool or a sinner. So, you know, you're <clears throat> you're talking okay. about different so kinds of people. So you're suggesting that Lachaim Center, or that us as Jews, that we go and we try to influence only people who are not fools and sinners, but are just sort of uneducated or unaware. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's better than nothing, but what about all the fools and sinners out there? But if a fool and sinner comes to you for help, you're obligated to help them. I'm not talking about standing outside and pulling it everybody off the you know, street, but if someone comes to you for help, you're, you're duty bound to help them. Okay. Teach them. If you know A, teach them A. If you know B, teach them B. I'll okay. pay, that's it, right? Okay. Okay, Marilyn, what were you going to say? Oops. Sorry. Sorry. I'm Sorry, you're still muted. Hello? Hi, there you go. You're good. Muting. Yeah. You're still muted, Okay. Unmute. Okay. How about that? Perfect. Okay. I was going to say that, um, you know, if a person is a good person, I mean, like if they are fooling and they don't know or whatever, that, that that's fine. But 
On the other hand, it doesn't mean to say that they're not a sinner if they did do a sinner, but then maybe they did it because they didn't know, but that's not the point. I think the point is that why not draw them into us that they come and join our Hebrew kind of thing so that uplifts them. And, uh, uh, you know, like none of us know that much, but if we know a little bit more than them, so maybe let them come. And, and 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 see what's going on they can make their decision but you know as long as they're not trying to pull us down or even it's not even because sometimes people don't mean to be pulling you down they just do pull you down because they're where they're at they're at but you know if I listen to this class now and know a little bit more so and if I speak about it and teach it to my friends so you know I'm not going to force them to do it but you know, they might, they might have something that they like. And next thing you know, they'll, they'll be coming, they'll join you. You, everybody's got to work from where they're at and try and bring others up. That, 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 that's okay. all. So I, okay. So I agree with what everybody's saying, but I just want to add one thing. So I, I can tell you, you know, having been in the profession of Jewish outreach for 25 years, I know a lot of stories, personal stories, personal friends, um, uh, Rabbis like me who went to Isha Torah and maybe they were not fully baked, which by the way is you know a big a big piece of this. Let's say they weren't fully baked in the oven and they, they went out a little too early to save the world because this guy over here, Noah Weinberg, told them, come on, you gotta go save the world. There are a lot of Jews out there. You gotta go out and save the world. I, and I know a lot of friends, and we, you know, we all bought into that. It was very, uh, it was very compelling. But they went out before they were strong enough in their own Yiddishkeit. And, um, and they, not only did they not bring others closer to Yiddishkeit, but they went, as we say, OTD, off the derrick. They completely left the path of Yiddishkeit entirely. Some of them got divorced left their families, got married to, you know, non-Jewish women, whatever. Uh, there are a lot of stories that I know personally. So it's just something that you have to be aware of. Of course, we have an obligation as Jews to reach out to our fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, to bring them closer, to teach them, to share with them the beauty of what we've learned and what we've studied and what we've experienced Judaism to be. And we have to do that. And we're obligated to do that. And it's not only for the rabbis and the professionals, but it's each and every one of us, you know, in our own businesses, in our own professions, in our own lives, we have to do that. But we just have to do it with an awareness that we have to be mashpia and not be mushpa, which means we have to be influencing, but not be influenced. We have to have, we have, to have our guard up. We have to have a certain... Um, protection, you know, that we've pre prepared for ourselves. You know, I know some rabbis that before they would go out and, and teach a class, you know, or go to like Torah and tequila type of event where they're going to be sitting and schmoozing with 20 guys who are going to be talking about all types of things that they don't speak about in yeshiva, right? That they would sit down and learn a little Ramchal before they would go, before they would go out and, and, and you know, get involved in, in, in situation like that just to just to stay focused and to remember that our job in the world is to go out and to share our values and to share our, our morality and to teach spirituality but not to be dragged down in the process of doing so because it's very easy to get pulled down in that direction that's what the Ram Khal is saying you have to know yourself and you have to be real with yourself you know if you're having a little bit too much fun going out, if the rabbi is having a little bit too much fun going out with the guys to the bars, then he needs to take an honest look at himself and say, wait a minute, am I doing this because I'm doing kiruv or am I doing this because they're doing kiruv on me? And all of a sudden, you know, this is, you know, I find myself hanging out at the bar instead of hanging out in the base medrash learning Torah. So it's just something that we have to be aware of um, that, that that we're always susceptible. We're always able to be influenced by the forces around us. Okay.
So this is the intention of what scripture states. This is Shlomo HaMelech King Salman in Proverbs. One who befriends a fool will be broken. Okay. One who befriends a fool will be broken. Now, again, it doesn't mean, you, you know, before somebody wants to be your friend, you have to give them a, you know, and say peace and see, you know, how, how smart they are or find out, you know, their level of intelligence and IQ test. Of course, it doesn't mean that. You have to, you know, just be aware that we are influenced in a very profound way by everybody we meet, by everything we see, by where we go, by what we do, by the community that we live in. So he says, he continues, um, for indeed we see many times that even after a person truly recognizes the obligation of the divine service and the zahirus needed for it, he will become lax about it. Like I said in the beginning, why is it so that so many of us, we want to live more focused lives. We want to live more spiritually oriented, God oriented lives. But we're not living to the degree that we want to. <coughs> Why is that? Why do we become lax in that area? Um, well, we transgress some of the rules of the heroes, right? So, um, sorry, I lost the spot there. He will become lax about it or transgress some of its rules so that his friends will not laugh at him or so that he can mingle with them. There's, there's peer pressure. There's, there's peer pressure. You know, we are, you know, we, 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 we get embarrassed about this. We don't want to look silly. I mean, I can tell you so many times in my own life that like there's moments where like, you know, I either have to make a choice of doing something that's like awkward and look strange or, you know, or, or not do what, what the Torah is demanding of me at a particular moment. Sometimes it's awkward if you go out to eat with a friend who has no idea what you know benching means and you and you're done eating a meal and you're sitting with them and, and they're like okay let's go and you're like well one second i um i have to mumble a bunch of words in hebrew first you know like it, it's it's awkward you know so what do you do some you know you can come up with a plan you can you know go go to the back of the restaurant and bench you can you can try to remember until after and, you know, you say goodbye to your friends and go back to the restaurant and bench, you know, or, you know, there's so many moments like that in the life of a Jew. I mean, we were just, we were just traveling back from America, you know, davening in an airport. Yeah, if you ever put on your towels and fill in an airport, talk about, you know, awkward situation, you know, especially like in Europe, you know, where like people look at you and it's the weirdest thing in the world. But Sometimes we have to do that as Jews. We have to be willing to do things that people are going to laugh at us about. Or, yeah, go ahead, Larry, and see if you guys, are, you guys have something you want to say, and then I'll, I'll point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm thinking about something a little, I think it's a little subtler. It's not a fool, and it's not a sinner. But we live in America, well, except for you, <laughs> where everything is very secular. And once we come out of our Lachayim world and see or, or associate in some form with people who are, let's say they're neutral, let's say they're Jews, they're not opposed to religiosity, but they're not, they haven't found it. They're just sort of there. Even that type of influence is diluting, I find. It's, it, if you're not with like-minded people, which is a lot of the time, then you have to keep reminding yourself or pulling yourself back into a focus of we, who you want to be and what you want your behavior to be. And not that you're doing anything negative, right. but it's, it just, it that's what I want to, I want to talk about that because that's obviously the, the, the practical sort of, um, you know, nuts and bolts of this. We'll talk, I want to talk about that in a minute. So we're going to get to that because that's, that's where this, um, you know, comes into real time in our lives. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but 
let me just finish this this sentence over here. He says that we're worried that people are going to laugh at us, or we just want to try to mingle with them. That's the other thing. Not necessarily that we're afraid of being mocked or afraid of you know people being made fun of, but we want to fit in. You know, we just want to fit in, and in order to to fit in, we're, we're going. To, we naturally are going to do all types of things that are not authentic to who we are. That's what fitting in means. If you think about what does it mean to fit in? It means to do something that's not authentic to who you are in order to be accepted in a group, okay? So you'll talk about things that, that you don't care about as if you do. You know, people are talking about movies. I have no idea what they're talking about when they're, you know, or television shows. And, you know, they, sometimes they can't believe that I don't know who this person is or this person is or this person is. Sometimes it just gets tiring and boring and, 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 and difficult to, you know, to be on the outside. So you pretend like you know what you're talking about or you yeah. talk about sports when you don't really care about sports or you talk about things. But it's not authentic. It's not who I am. So we have to compromise on our authenticity in order, we don't have to, but we tend to in order to fit into a situation. That's, that's, a, that's a human tendency. Okay, this is what Shlomo HaMelech said when he, when he warned us with the centers, do not mingle. Okay, so that's, that is really the, the issue. The, the, the problem is um, we can compromise on, on our uh, being our true authentic self and, um, and we don't want to do that. Because Zahirus, because then, then we give up on our Zahirus. Because then we're giving up on, on really growing and really being the superstars that we want to be. And really reaching our potential and, and tapping into who we have that, that ability to be. So, and, and we do that in order to feel comfortable with other people so that people don't think we're weird or so that we can fit in a little bit. So Susie's point is, um, is the one that's most relevant, to, I think, to probably everybody on this call. And that is, you know, everybody here has a lot of experience coming to Lachaim Center, or learning some learning in other environments, or you know being you know being involved in, in Jewish learning and Jewish growth and, and Shabbos and Yontif and all these things. But I'm no I know that everybody here in this call also has a whole world outside of that reality. You have friends that are not learning and growing the way you're learning and growing. You have children who are not learning and growing the way you're learning and growing. You have grandchildren, you have, you have people in, at work, you have all kinds of people around you that you can't avoid, nor should you avoid, who are not learning and growing the same way that, that you're learning and growing. So how do you deal with that? What's the appropriate way when, when you have situations where you're gonna socialize, you're gonna go out with another couple, okay? And this other couple doesn't learn power. They don't, they don't know what Shabbos is. They're not involved in the Chaim Center or somewhere like the Chaim Center. So what are the solutions to this problem? I want to hear from you. I want to, I have some that I want to share also, but I want to hear from you because this is really important. This is real life. This is taking Torah and integrating it in, in, in a real way into our lives. And it's, uh, it's important, but we need to get this right. Yes, Father. Dad. Oh no! Just straightening the phone. Hi, David. Yes. I think you want. Yeah. You know, can I just mention one thing because I don't want to let this go to the end and it won't be said. There's also a different way that that dealing with fools um, can can destroy you. You can. You can get cynical about trying to educate people. In other words, you can really try to help people. And this is, I'm in the helping people business. It is very difficult. And it's same thing spiritually. Um, and it can make you get cynical to the point is, you know what? I give up. I'm just going to focus on my own spirituality and maybe my spouse, maybe the one, my one kid who's into it. And that's it, right? Because yeah, it can it can grind you down. Yep. Because if you try to help, my experience, you help ten people. One, you'll really help. 
Two, two, sort of, and the rest of them, you might help them once, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And my mom just met and said something on the chat over here, which I think is a great point, which is that I'm assuming you get email to my mom, but I don't know. Is that not spelled right? Who's that, Judy? Is that Judy Deegan? Um, whoever, whoever wrote, whoever Judy is over here, sending that to my mom. Yes, it is. She said, the danger here is not acting holier than thou, because nothing is more off plate, right? That's, that's one of the challenges of this whole thing, is that as soon as you cross that line where you're holier, and because you're learning, and you're studying, and you're, you know, eh, gross, stay away from me, the relationship is over, right? So you can't, you, you walk a fine line with people that are not learning, that are not part of our world, where you want to make it a meaningful experience, potentially a learning growth oriented experience, but you're also very conscious not to step over the line of being holier than thou. How do you navigate that and how do you do that? Yeah, good, 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 good point. Yeah, Marilyn. David. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll come to you in a second. Yeah, one second. Go ahead, Marilyn. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking that the uh, one of the ways perhaps is not to try and educate them, but rather to show them. And like one very nice way to do it is, for example, have a Shabbat. So you have your Shabbat and you ask lots of other, uh, you ask some other friends and that person sees, oh, this is so nice and this is such nice people. And then you could say to them from there, you know, well, you know, if ever you want to come with me to, on Shabbat, you want to come to a class, let me know. Let's let's do it together. In other words, not trying to change them in any way, just let them see that there's value here and it's yeah. nice and there's good people. And Bravo, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. The power of Shabbat itself, you know, without Shabbat speaks for itself. When people come for the first time and see people sitting around a table without their phones out, and they're having meaningful discussion and it, parents are sitting with kids and friends are sitting with friends and they're talking to one another and they're enjoying each other, they're in company and they're not distracted. And it's Shabbos, that, that, that's a powerful, powerful experience for sure. Wait, I'm gonna take my father and I'm gonna take you Julie, one sec, okay. Okay, what I was thinking is, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is basically, outreach is basically <clears throat> excuse me, a sales job, okay? And I learned early on that in sales, one of the most important things to do is to know your audience. You have to know that if you're gonna say something to a person, it's either gonna A, turn them off, or B, turn them on. So the first thing you have to do is really know with whom you're speaking before, and adjust your presentation, quote unquote, yeah. to, to whom you're dealing with. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Some people, the best thing to do is say nothing about you because there's no chance that they're going to listen or care if, and, and they're going to be, they're going to be threatened and they're going to feel judged and, you know, but, but, and, and, and for other people, there's an opening and you should try to share a little bit, but I would just add a word of, of, uh, um, sort of a nuanced piece to that, which is that I think we might have a tendency to um, err on the side of not trying to have any influence at all because of the fact that we, you know, we're going to turn people off or they're going to think that we're religious fanatics or they're going to think that we're crazy. So we probably, there are probably moments and opportunities where we could share a little something or expose another Jew just a little bit, you know, and we probably don't because, you know, of the sort of discomfort maybe involved in it. So we don't want to let ourselves off too easy. At the same time, we, it's very important, yeah, to know, to know who our audience. Julie. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, I try and do it just in really small ways, like, um, just sharing miracles, like miracles that I've experienced in my life and sharing them with other people. And then, you know, they start to see like, oh, wow, yeah, there's there is a higher power out there and a, a God who's controlling the world. And then also just saying, like, thank God or 
all the time. You know, like we I had a moment at work where something like everything, something happened that we've been hoping for for a long time. And I said to my team, I said, let's just take a moment and thank God that this, you know, happened. And and I was like a little nervous, but you know, I think people, it was like two seconds. And, yeah. you know, and I think I've noticed just with my family, the more I say it, the more they're like, they're kind of getting on board. They're like, yeah, let's look at all these miracles in our lives and awesome. starting to rub off. I think a that's little. a, I think it's a beautiful idea. Just sharing your own, you know, and I'm not asking you to believe it or not believe it. I'm just want to share something exciting to me that, that happened in my life that I, that I view it, that I'm grateful to the chef for and, you know, and, and, and that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Um, I just, I, I actually, this, this conversation was great. It went in a little bit of a different direction than I intended, which is totally fine. But I was, I was also taking it from, when I asked the question, I also intended from a different angle, which is that um, we, we this, just now we, we approach this from the angle of how can we have a positive sort of spiritual influence on other people in our lives that are not really involved in the type of learning or the type of uh, Jewish experiences that we are. I think what I initially intended the question to be was how can we avoid in situations where we inevitably have to be or want to be with people that are not experiencing life the way we are with Judaism as much, how to not let it bring us down and, and pull us away from where we want to be and how we want to look at things and how we want to you know, be in the world. Um, so I think that's also part of what I was, is that what I was trying to get at? Um, Mike, did you unmute? Did you have something you want to say? Well, I was about? just going to say like in that example, I think you look at those situations as, as, as we were just talking about, that's how you can get value out of that by living to your values as an example. And it just, just, holding to your values and interact with somebody else who has this different set of values is a way to sort of teach by example. And that's how you can approach those situations, realizing that, yes, somebody may have a different set of ideals and, and, or, or things that would be against your belief system. But if you hold true to that, your belief system in those interactions, again, you're teaching by example. And then, okay. and, and to remember that, to that, that, that in those, in those situations. Yeah, I, I think that's very good. I think it's hard to do that. I mean, I think everyone's different, but like I'm a, I, and by nature, I'm sort of a, um, a, a avoid conflict, conflict avoiding type of person, right? So like if somebody like starts spewing out, you know, stuff that I think is, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. Um, we have a relative, actually, I'm not, <laughs> not gonna give this example. No, don't even do that. <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't even know who I was going to talk about. But oh, I, all our relatives are nuts. Exactly. <laughs> I could have gone in any one of many directions. <laughs> all right, but it doesn't matter. I won't. I won't give the example. But right, you know, there are situations where, and, and my and my tendency in that situation is just to kind of keep quiet and not stir up the pot and not, you know make a whole big explosion out of it because uh, it's just not worth it and it's right. pointless right so so um, on the other hand you know it, you can't spend too much time with a person like that because you're either going to explode or you're eventually going to be influenced by their views if they're very influential and, and they have some kind of you know um, gift for for you know, being able to, to explain themselves very well, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's a fear there. So what I, what I wanted to say over here, and I want to hear more from, from what you guys think about this also, but what I wanted to say over here is, first of all, Aleph of this formula, step one of the formula is choosing who are the people that we want to go out with and who are the people that we do not want to go out with. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, um, qualify that in a minute by saying we can't always choose we don't always have the luxury of only being with the people that we want to be with but let's start by building our social calendar in such a way where at least the majority or at least a, a portion of our social calendar is um is occupied with people that we do feel like we can have growth oriented 
conversation with, okay? Um, so we want to think about who are the people that we do want to go out with and spend time with, and who are the people that we don't. And you know, and what are the and, and, and I think one of the ways of deciding this is what do these people, the Joneses, what do they tend to talk about when we go out with them? I, I love I love the Eleanor Roosevelt quote that great minds discuss ideas and average minds discuss events and small minds discuss people. Right? Again, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. So are, are the Joneses the type of people or the Schwartzes the type of people that when you go out with them, right away it's, hey, did you hear about the Goldberg? Did you hear that this couple is getting a divorce? Did you hear this kid, their kids in rehab? Did you hear this, you know, this one got kicked out of college? And it, I don't need that in my life. Right. I don't need that in my life. So there might be times when I have no choice, especially if they're relatives or whatever. OK, <laughs> but for the most part, I want to choose to try to be with people that are open to conversations that are productive, that are positive, that are enlightening. OK, now, as I said, let's always give you the luxury of only spending time with the people that you're going to find uplifting. So. When you know you're going into a social situation, you're having dinner with, this, with the Schwartzes, and you know the Schwartzes have the tendency to drag the conversation down to small minds, you know, to talking about the Goldbergs and this and that and that, then you have to come prepared. You gotta come prepared. So how do you come prepared? Think about some things that you wanna talk about that you think will be interesting to them. Forget Judaism, I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, I want to tell you what the Ramchal said to speak or what the, what's going on in the Parsha. Just yeah. ideas or events or ideas that are interesting that you can ask, think of some questions in advance. You know, yeah. uh, we love this thing called the Shabbat box, you know, that the, that the Andrews turned us on to because the Shabbat box, is, it's questions. So you're sitting around the table on Shabbos, you know, even, even with your own family, the conversation has can have a tendency to, spiral down into, into either um, meaningless discussion at best or destructive discussion at worst. So you lift it up by how you pull up the Shabbat box and you ask a question. If you could spend one Shabbos with anyone that ever lived, who would it be? And boom, all of a sudden you're having an amazing, powerful, inspiring conversation, right? So if you know that you're going into a social situation with the Schwartzes, and the Schwartzes have that tendency to bring things to that low place. You got to come prepared. Um, you got to come prepared with what what um, what you're gonna how you're going to make uplift that conversation in that that evening as much as possible. Uh, David. Yeah. Sometimes I you know prepare by right, reading the Wall Street Journal about what the husband's business is, because that's all they're interested in. So right. I'm actually, I'm out, or if I'm listening to Marketplace on the, on the radio, anything that refers to this particular business, which is really what this person really wants to talk about, yeah, that's what I do, because there's other stuff. If you haven't read the Parsha, you don't know what the Parsha is, sometimes this is met with silence, Nothing, yeah. nothing at all. I think it's a great idea. In other words, if you know you're going out with a certain couple and you know that they're very interested in X, then go online before you go out with them, read an article about X, and then you can discuss it with them. They'll be right. happy to discuss it. You'll be happy to discuss it. The time will pass and then two hours will go by and you will not have spoken about anybody who's getting divorced exactly. or anyone who's kids are in rehab. Yeah. Or anyone who's getting yeah, people, people like to talk about themselves and what they're interested in. So if you can find that out. Now, a steady diet of that is not very nourishing to the you know, soul. But there are people that have, you know, they're good right. people. They're not interested in what, what you are interested in. So you have to titrate that. And that's a way around it. Yeah. You could right. also I, find, I, take you could take their topic, but somehow find an angle on it that's meaningful to you as well. Like it's yeah. part of their business, like, you know, how do they approach their treating their employees? You know, something they connect it, that the, the, the topic is interesting to them, but then you find an angle on it that makes it even more meaningful. Right. 
The main thing is the bottom line is come prepared. Don't go into the evening without having given any, any thought because if you do, you know where it's going to go. It's going to go right down to lush and hara, negative speech, and you don't, you don't. That's not where you want. You, how do you want to spend an evening? Susie, I, I want to hear from you guys because I'm sure you have some, you know, experiences along these lines. How, how, how have you guys handled these types of situations, Susie and Larry? It's been nice. Have you try? Have you tried this approach? You're on mute. Presented with preparation or choosing people to be with. I think those are all really good, but. Um, I find that if I'm with people, not necessarily that they're saying Lush and horror, but they're just um, talking about maybe worldly events or whatever. And I find myself being very quiet and then walking, which I'm not typically quiet, and then walking away and saying, why, why am I here? And what, what am I doing here? But yet I don't really get together with casual people. I mean, the people that this is an issue for me are people that I've known 30 and 40 years who I love. Right. But they're not on the same page that I am. So I, I mean, I think some of these other, in terms of <coughs> choosing people, well, that's, that's not going to apply. Coming prepared with ideas is, is a good idea to what you can talk about, but I could use more suggestions like that because I find that I'm quiet because I don't want to sound holier than thou. And right. I've been in that situation before and then I feel uncomfortable afterwards. Right. So sports looking for new ideas, <laughs> how to deal with, oh, not that I can push people away now that are casual that I don't have to start new relationships that have any depth to them or intensity. But the people that are already in my life, I can't push them away. So um, you talk about memories, you can reminisce, you can, children. you can talk about good times, you can talk about, you know, how far you've come together and, you know, as a family and, and, and positive trends that you see going on in the family, if you're talking about family members or, you know, trying to keep it positive in that way. Um, yeah, Marilyn. A man, the, the, the universal lubricant for men is sports. I've, I mean, I listen to the score, just all I have to do is just have the highlights and say, boy, the Cubs really blew it. And then the Cubs fan will talk about 10 minutes about the bullpen, about, about the front office. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, throwing just a little tidbit here and there. And um, yeah, especially in That's the beginning it. of the evening, it kind of gets people into it. doesn't the have to be, you don't have to walk away from every interaction as a positive or uplifting situation. You just have to, you're trying to avoid it's going down. Yeah, uh, Larry, what were you gonna say? That? Rabbi, there's something that, that's bothering me here. The first part point that Ramchal made was do not occupy yourself with worldly events. And this discussion seems to be how do we bring worldly events into this situation? It seems they're almost uh, diametrically opposed, yet we're drifting towards it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that this is a, um, what we're talking about over here is not the ideal. In other words, like I said in the beginning, you want to ideally construct your calendar in such a way where the majority of the people that you're spending time with are people that you can grow from and that you can inspire and be inspired by and share, you know, words and, and conversations that will focus help us and help us move forward in our lives in the positive ways that we want to. But now we kind of switch to situations that you can't get out of because you, the obligations either because they're family. And, and I'm, like Susie made a good point. These are not people that we don't love. We do love them. They're family members. They're old friends. We do love them and we feel close to them. But we just, when, we have, when we're with them, we want to try to make sure that they don't 
conversation into places that we don't necessarily want to go. So there we have to come sort of armed a little bit. Yeah, Marilyn. Wait, Marilyn, you keep muting yourself. Yeah. Okay, I'm mute. Okay. Now. Yeah. Technology. I was going to say to Susie, you know, that idea of the Shabbat box. So don't call it the Shabbat box. Call it the, the box. Have, think, sit down, like I'm going to do now. I think it's a fantastic idea of ideas. So let's say you're with those, those family who are not particularly interested in religion or whatever. So instead of saying, who would you like to have? What is the person you'd like to have a Shabbat with? Hey, look at us. We're all having such a fantastic meal. Who is the one person or the two people you would like to have uh, a dinner with? And why? And that person's going to talk about whoever it is. Maybe it's a sports car. And maybe it's something else. But, you know, that way it directs the question, uh, the discussion, and you can bring other things up. I mean, it's not like they're sitting there and giving a lecture. There'll be a discussion. And it just yeah. gets the ball rolling into interesting areas. And that's, that's great idea. You know, that's the thing. But have 20 questions whenever you come, or even a like, well, I wouldn't bring up Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, um, quote, but there's millions of quotes that we <laughs> absolutely love. Just ask, what is your favorite quote? What is your favorite book? What, you know, yeah. get the ball rolling that way because once they said what their favorite book, whether you're interested or you're not interested, it'll be your turn soon enough and you can say, well, this is mine. Just get the ball rolling. It's, it's, funny, so it's, it's, a fabulous. It's, it's funny that you brought up a Shabbat box because I think I have a Shabbat box from like 25 years ago. And when I moved, I didn't get rid of it. I still have it. I have to go pull it out and look <laughs> yeah. at it. Right. Yeah. It was in the one thing, was, one thing I just want to add, by the way, is generally speaking, don't talk about politics. Oh, no. That never ends well. Um, okay. It's, uh, it's, it's 1030. I think uh, we're going to we're going to wrap it up here. We'll continue um, next week. We didn't get quite as far as I wanted, but next week, God willing, we'll finish chapter five. I uh, will do a little summary and then we'll start a, a new, the new meter of alacrity, Zerizus, ah, not to be confused with Zerizus. Sound very similar in Hebrew. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank David. You. Thank David. David. Thank you. Call me and tell me. Tell me who the relative was. <laughs> no chance. Well, why don't you stay on for a second? So stay on for a second, Bob. I'm not going to tell you that, but I have another thing to ask you. Okay. okay. Just find the just find the mirror. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what up, Bob? See you later. All right. <laughs> Take care, David. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you. It's great. Ruby, which Ruby is that? See Ruby, but I don't know who Ruby is. So I guess I'm not going to find out. Right. Ruby, who are you? Ruby's going. Um. I was going to tell the story about meeting with Dan Cole and talking about J Street, but then I realized that that Stacy Cole is often on the uh, on the call. Not good. Not good. Uh, trip. Yeah, we going. What else well, say? He said he would. He's more interested in. <clears throat> hi, dear. More interested in. <clears throat> And just being together than where he goes, but his first choice would not be Israel. So I've gone to Barnes and Noble a couple of times in the last few days. Not on Shabbos. <clears throat> and yeah. discovered that I think we could go pending the fact that you could get a Shabbos somewhere. We could go to Lisbon, stay in the same place for the whole time and do easy day trips to spectacular stuff. 
Yeah, like what? Just Church, just, churches, cathedrals, no church. castles. It's a very, it's a, yeah, castles and buildings and, you know, but the question is, I also looked up, there's a lot of Jewish Judaism in that area. So before you, you know, my reaction was, it's too Catholic for me at this stage in my life. But I looked up and there, there are considerable Jewish things. There's three Chabad's. There's kosher restaurants. So do your homework before, because I am I could very easily say to Elliot, no, I think let's just go to Israel. It's easier. But um, it's a it's five hour flight from you. And I would just look up the Judaism and, and 10 day trips from Lisbon and let me know in the next day or so. 10, 10, 10 days? No, 10 day trips. Uh-huh. You know, just so you pick your pick three or four of them. Uh-huh. But I was thinking we get there Monday and um, we, we could leave Sunday to go to Israel. Um, or Elliot and I, we can meet Monday. You could be with us for three days and then go to uh go back before shabbos it all depends on you at this point right my i have one little thing that's kind of important to me which is that tuesday november 1st are the elections here and i really want to vote and i don't think you can vote early but maybe you can how about absentee uh, there's no absentee voting in Israel. Um, okay. so, um, so what about November leaving, leaving the, the following Sunday, which is like the 5th or 6th of November? Yeah, yeah that I could do. That I think I can do. Uh-huh. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll explore. I can, I'll see if I can muster up an interest in Portugal. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> Zalman. Is it, is it in either there or having left? And we could talk to him about it. Um, I thought he was in Israel. He's going to Israel, but he's he's in Portugal. Okay. No, um, I'm not talking about. <clears throat> I'm not talking about, you know, an overnight trip or anything. Stay in one place, mellow, easy, right. and just go to you know. I don't. I think I would stay for Shabbos in that case. I think I'd probably fly in on Sunday. I see that there are, um, there's no nonstop flights to Lisbon, but there are layover flights. Um, you know, they're really, they're, they're not expensive for me anyway. Um, I don't think there's any nonstop flights. Well, there is a nonstop flight on Monday that leaves at 5.30 a.m. and gets in at 9.40 a.m. That's actually pretty good. Six hours. Yeah, we would leave. We would leave. I would get in at, I would get in at 9.40 a.m. on Monday. Okay. We yeah. could leave. You know, Elliot could come here. We could leave together. And he's doing some researching. I think we could get there right around the same time. Do right. we have Monday, we have Tuesday, have Wednesday? Monday, we'd have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's only four days, man. Yeah. So but maybe see if there's see if there's the Jewish family where you could sleep at for Shabbos. You know, there's right. Kabbalah. Right, and then if, if that's the case, then I could. Um, I could take a nonstop flight back on. We could, we could take a nonstop flight back on Sunday. I could fly Air Portugal on Monday. Get in at nine forty a.m. and fly back on Sunday. Get back at nine forty p.m. Plus about six hundred bucks or something. Um, all right, I'll look into it. All right, I think I. You know, I. 
I've also decided that this trip, I'm with you. If you stay for Shabbos, Friday night and Saturday morning, Elliot's going to have to be on his own. Life has changed since the last time. I want to dive it. Okay, fine. I mean, he, I think Elliot will be fine. So be like, yeah, he would be. be. Happy to have 24 yeah. hours on his own. Yeah, so do your, do wow. your research on Lisbon. Tena, Tena Palace and Park looks pretty cool. It's beautiful. Cabo de Roca Castells. I mean, I think it'll be a lot of nice walking and- Elliot's uh, been there. He was there for a week one time by accident. <clears throat> he had a meeting for three days and then his plane was canceled. So he spent like five days. He said, you could really enjoy Lisbon and then take some day trips. And he of course, as, as always would be interested in all the Jewish stuff except the Davide. Right. Um, all right. Okay. What else? Uh, what have you? Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, nothing. I blew the shofar today. Oh, yeah? God, he's gone today and tomorrow. So uh, we had five guys, but at least we heard the shofar. That's cool. Um, I actually know a guy from Portugal. I'd have to find that dude. He lives somewhere in the neighborhood here. I could find him probably. Um, but yeah, there's, Chabad. there's definitely Chabad in Portugal. Kosher, let's see where the kosher restaurants are. No, they say kosher, but there's kosher and there's kosher like we found on that street in uh, oh, in Poland. Okay. I don't know. Well, I no, have there's, web, there's websites that show real, you know, kosher, totally Jewish travel here. Um, kosher and Jewish life in Portugal. Um, there's in Porto, Porto, um, There's a Sherry Sedek um, shul in Portugal. Yeah. It could be reformed, who knows? Right. All right, I'll, I'll look into it a little bit. Yeah, I, I was pleasantly surprised by my little research. And I love the location. It's very convenient. Right. You guys can fly direct. I don't know. Oh, you should be able to. I don't know. Elliot's working on it. Okay. Uh, I haven't really talked to mom today, but oh, there's a there's a bed and breakfast near the synagogue that has kosher meals and, and Shabbat meals. So that's good. Yeah. I haven't really yeah. talked to mom. I got a thumbs up when I just walked in, but yesterday was brutal. She's still going through it. So, yeah. No, we spoke, we spoke to her. Ellie spoke, we, we spoke to her. Ellie spoke to her. This morning? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Let me know as soon as you can. There's a um, there's three hour visits. There's Lisbon Jewish tours, the best way to discover Lisbon old quarters and all the Jewish history of Portugal, like we, there's like these three hour tours. Yeah, I saw that. Um, they go all, um, at least only shows through September, but. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, are you still on Jeff? <laughs> okay, that was a, that was levity without hurting anybody. Goodbye. All right. <laughs> Talk Bye. To you. Bye, love you. Love you too.